Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Khalil Doheny, and I'm the Director of Content Marketing at Digital Niche Agency. Today, we have Stephen Forte from the Build Club. Stephen, how are you doing today? Hey, good. What's going on, Khalil? Good to see you again. Good to see you, too. And everyone else, Happy New Year. I know it's a little late in the month, but still, it's a new year. Stephen, hopefully, you know, the new year's kicking off, right? It's going awesome. And that is a good question. When do you stop saying Happy New Year? When does it become just awkward? Is it like the end of January, February? I don't know. We're going to have to Google that. I know. I always go for the, the first month. After that, you know, it's it's done late. But awesome. Really excited for today's event. I know you have a lot to talk about. And I'm kind of just going to hand the mic to you if you want to just lay out the land of what, we, what we're going to discuss today and what the uh, audience can expect. 100%. Well, hey, thanks everyone for being here today or even watching recorded. I wanted to get a chance to really talk a bit about what we're doing in our products. You know, I really like to spend time on these webinars going into detail. I mean, there's nothing else I hate more than wasting time going into a webinar with someone. I do a lot of angel investing, so I want to hear detail what's going on in the business. What are, their, what are they doing with their products? Something maybe I didn't know before. So we'll be digging into the weeds on a little bit of it today. So from a topic perspective, I'll share with everyone. Clearly, I assume you can see everything cool, right? Yep, yeah, I like to always make sure you never know. You get halfway through a slide or two and no one can see a thing. So we're going to talk a bit about our sourcing service today, how we're evolving that in terms of our kind of on-demand sourcing. We have a new price discovery website we're really excited to talk about. A browser extension tool, which you know many of you may or may not know what they are, and I'll talk about how we're using that. We have a new plugin for Revit, which is an AutoCAD program. We're going to talk about our AI quoting features and our blueprint capability, our blueprint read. So this is going to be pretty exciting for us. And our technology partnerships with Google and Microsoft, which, uh, you know, it's it, kind of funny that they landed in the same week in December. And frankly, had they there been a big gap, maybe one wouldn't have done it if they knew the other was. So we got kind of lucky there. So I'm going to roll right into our business sourcing model. So as you know, we're kind of on-demand delivery of materials. That's really what got us on the map here. And we're looking at shifting some of that to almost like a fee-based surface rather than a markup. So we discovered along the way that we get you know, a lot of orders or average order around $1,000 or so, which is way more than Home Depot or Lowe's. But we really want to form it as a service, so almost like sourcing as a service, if you think, where people can pay a subscription price, have us automatically essentially do the sourcing for them, and make it more fee-based rather than markup-based. Meaning that if you add uh, 10, 20 percent markup to a material, that might be fine for someone who's ordering two, three, four hundred dollars worth of material. But if they're ordering five or ten or fifteen thousand, are you really adding, are we in this case, really adding enough value to warrant that kind of margin? And frankly, it may turn a lot of people off because it's just too expensive. So we're finding the right model there. So we're excited to do that. Along the way, we get some great discounts from our suppliers we buy from, and that'll allow us to pass a lot of those discounts, essentially, to a lot of smaller contractors. And keep in mind today that over 90% of the contractors in the United States have around five or seven employees or less. I've forgotten the exact stat, but it's somewhere in there. So it's a huge plethora of the contractors that are out there that need it. And, and really making it, like I say, less punitive on the orders. We're going to utilize, of course, our quoting tools, our AI tools, and all this for ourselves as we roll forward and make the pricing a bit more transparent. So we're just super excited about rolling that out and really being the true outsourced sourcing department. So you're going to see some tweaks in our regular sourcing business model. Now, it's been a little while since I've talked about technology, and I know we have a lot of new investors and a lot of new followers. So bear with me as I do a little bit of a technology primer. What I'd like to do is, again, give a little depth on what it is we're doing here and going into details and offering context. If you're going to spend your time listening to me talk about the Build Club, I think you want to learn something and hear what it is we're really doing. So one of the things we do is obviously scan and track millions and tens of millions of items from all over the country now, and we absorb all that digitally into our system. We scan now 17 million plus separate products. We scan them every day. So we actually generate about 800 million new records per month. When you think of every single product we update every day with its inventory status, price, and other material. We dump all of that into a massive cloud database. And it's actually a no SQL database. And I know some people 
don't know what that is. So if years ago you worked with Microsoft Access or one of these other databases, that was a relational database. That's kind of like a bunch of spreadsheets that are tied together with particular keys or signals. Well, our problem is you can't do that with this kind of data because the, the components or segments or features, if you want to call it that, of lumber are, are very different than a DeWalt drill, right? The drill, you're going to have issues such as voltage, speed, size, whatever it might be. Lumber, it's type of wood, species, pressure treated, fire treated, length, width. And you can't put that in a single database that's built on a table. So to give you an idea of what data looks like when you use a NoSQL database or what they call kind of a document-driven database, it's kind of the, what you're seeing there on the right-hand side of your screen. It's a list of kind of nested trees, you might say, of data. So it's not structured like you see on the left where you have a table of materials, a key that lines them between. It's just one essentially big blob of document. So doing that's a big deal because we have to tie in these hundreds of millions. In this case, we now have billions of records on all this material. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have in our industry and what makes it unique and brings, frankly, us a lot of value is the fact that, you know, there's no common SKU or UPC code for a two by four, right? If you're looking for a Nike Jordan size 10 and a half shoe, that UPC code you have is going to be the same everywhere. You're going to plug it into Google Shopping or Amazon, and you're going to find all the vendors who have it, that exact shoe for that exact price. Building materials don't work that way. And it's frankly kind of by design. People don't want you to comparison shop that easily. So we have to do a lot of work to make that happen. So we bring all of that data in. We standardize the products. We then tie them all together through this search standardization. And then we build a catalog by using AI and other tools to really figure out what material is what. So let me give you a little example. So if you take some of this data in, in this case, you might be looking at lumber. So we'll have different types of lumber from different suppliers at different prices. We absorb that into our systems. And now our AI engines, frankly, in multiple different methods, have to really figure out, is that two by four piece of wood at whatever, Menards, the same as that two by four piece of wood at ABC Lumber or Home Depot or somewhere else? So our system has to define that. Because in many cases, actually, I'd say in almost all cases, the data we get in from these suppliers, they don't have the same name. They don't have any sort of brand. There's no common UPC serial number manufacturer number. So, so we have to use a couple of different methods to tie it all together. And no one clustering method is good enough. So we have to use several different methods. And I'll talk about that shortly so you kind of understand that a little better. And, you know, we have to define these different types of things, such as wood species, because Douglas fir, for example, has a, has a, a strength rating, a Janka rating of about 880, southwestern pines around 660. Most of it can be used interchangeably, but sometimes it can't. So people need to also understand that, the, that for many cases, the type of wood can make a big difference. So we have to break all of these segments down together, and we focus a lot on this kind of AI space. So to give you an example, we use vector embedding for many of the components. And in this case, you essentially turn aspects of a sentence or a description in this case for a product into numbers so the computer can understand it. And then those numbers are able to define with the algorithms how similar those two items are. So a two by four by 16 piece of wood of Douglas fir is very, very similar to a two by four by 16 piece of a uh, piece of wood that's southwestern pine. They're not exact, but they're very similar and could potentially be used interchangeably. So in this case, if you look at the sentence where it says, say, feline friends say, or or uh, canine friend or you know companions say, they're very, very similar in what they're saying. You can see them up here in the quadrant. However, we use a second technology called semantic search, which now looks for the meaning of the other material that's in our document, which might be a description, it might be measurements or others. So the vector in this case is deciding where the feline and the canine land on this map and how correlated they are. But then the semantic search finds meaning with meow and says, okay, that's related to cats and places it there. So that's kind of hopefully a clear example of how we have to tie these materials together. And it's quite a bit of work. 
We do the same for images. So images in this case are really broken down to numbers as well, based on different shades of color, grayscale, what have you. And you can see the way this image is relegated in a number. And this is part of machine learning. And this is really a subset again of AI. So you may have used this before if you've ever used Google Lens. So Google Lens does the exact same thing. Hey, what's that tennis shoe? That's great. I want to look it up in Amazon. So we use a lot of that function. So back to our data, we then break all of this stuff down into tokenizations and words. Now, there's, there's a lot of things to consider along the way in this. And, and for us, a lot of it is, has to do with synonyms. So synonyms matter, right? So someone might type in a search that it's SYP for Southern Yellow Pine or you know, DF for Douglas fir, or just fir, F-I-R. So we have to understand what all of those alternatives or synonyms are on what meaning is, because many of it is, isn't that logical. Some of the new NLM engines, if you look at ChatGPT and others, can do that quite well, but the problem is they take 10, 20, 15 seconds in many cases, and you're not gonna sit in someone's search engine and wait 30 seconds. It's just not there yet. Uh, it will be at some point, but right now it isn't. So a lot of that has to be done in the background so you don't have to sit and wait. So that starts to allow us to really break down what materials are similar, what can be common use. We then bring in certain weights and you might see different weights and, you know, and other components we need, such as you know, what is the grade of the lumber, right? What is the moisture content, other components? So we tie all that together and hopefully make a result that works. So, so where does all that come? Well, that all comes back down then to our system where someone gets into our search engine and we're also able to clear all that data. You can see kind of below the way this is all weighted. So ultimately our engine has to decide when someone types 2x, 4x, 8, okay, does he mean a two by four by eight piece of lumber or is that person referring to something else? So we have to make some decisions along the way and then be able to tie all that into our AI, remove any duplicates that might be in those systems, find the items that are closest, that have the best price, and pull all of that together into an end product into our databases. So this is just kind of a little peek under the hood on some of the things that we do with this data and why it takes so much time, energy, and effort to make this happen on these big data structures. But the, end, the benefit is really quite immense. And we can do so many amazing things with this data. So this is one example. This is a heat map of R30 insulation that was available in a particular time. So we can detect now with this data and have a national snapshot on what markets have availability of certain materials and what don't. And at this time, when this happened, we actually moved four or five truckloads of insulation into Arizona that was out of insulation for about three weeks. And we helped builders complete their projects and save tons of money from delays and inspections and things they couldn't do. Because the traditional suppliers, their answer is, hey, you know, my, my the wholesale house delivers in three weeks. Good luck, come back then. And, and most of them, frankly, don't even move materials between warehouses or stores. So it's there's not a whole lot of flexibility, which is kind of weird. And you know, if I walk into a Foot Locker tomorrow and I want a size 10, you know, that back to that size 10 and a half Nike shoe, in many cases, they're like, hey, I'll have a guy here by 4 p.m. delivering it from another store and you can take it off. And that's a $100 pair of shoes. But you can go in looking for $10,000 of dimensional lumber from a warehouse. And they're like, yep, sorry, the guy doesn't come till next week. And, you know, you may be burning a ton of money in labor or other types of costs in the project. So how else are we monetizing this data? What else are we doing that's cool? Now that you understand a little bit of what's behind the scenes, how do we, how do we make cool products out of that? So one thing we just launched, and if you go into our website, you go under shop, you'll see an extra icon there to go into our discovery site. And this is like a Google Flights or Kayak for building materials. So you can actually get into our site, see a histogram of the history of price for that product. And frankly, see a list of all the materials and where it's available and find the best price. No one's been able to do this before. How would you know you'd have to log into Menard's website? Then you log into Lowe's. Then you log into Home Depot. And you'd be absolutely amazed how even Home Depot can vary between 10, 20, 50% or more the price of products between their own stores, even six, five, three miles away. Blew me away. I didn't expect that. I kind of thought it was, 
you know, McDonald's pricing, right? You pay for a Big Mac and it's the same kind of price everywhere. So I'll show a quick video snapshot of what we do rather than doing live demo. I thought this was easier. So I just rec recorded it. So you can see here when you pull a product up, we show you the lowest price. We show you the closest locations, a list of all the stores that have that material. We also show inventory because maybe you need 200 of these things, right? And you can't find it. And you'll notice here the first page was Lowe's. Just so happens the second page on this one's Home Depot because they're more expensive. So from now on, people have a single place to go. You're able to find that product you want, know what store has it, what inventory level they have, and frankly, who's the cheapest. So, you know, you might drive two miles farther and save 10, 20, 30, 50%, depending on what you're shopping for. So we're super excited about this product and we've just launched it. We're on a beta site. So I encourage you to go check it out and see how we're doing. We got a lot of work to do on it, but we like to release products early, even when they're kind of clunky, just so we can get things better in the market. Okay, so driving people to our website, you know, it's it's a gallant thought, right? It's a noble task of getting people to do that, but it's also difficult, expensive. Who the heck is Build Club? So when you start doing the numbers, it's pretty interesting. And if you look at Home Depot and Lowe's, for example, so Home Depot had roughly 1.7 billion transactions last year, people who've transacted buying from them. Lowe's, another 800 plus million. So you're looking between the two of them, two and a half billion transactions. Estimates are roughly 20% of those are online. So about a half a billion. We think that's an amazing opportunity to go after, which is why we've developed our browser plugin. So for those of you who aren't familiar, haven't done it, a browser plugin is a little piece of software you can load, in this case, Chrome. We're going to do the same thing for Edge and for Safari and Firefox too, actually, so that you can load this little piece of software like you see in the circle. And when that's running and you're on the Home Depot or the Lowe's site and soon Menards, Ace, True Value, or any of the other hardware stores, you're going to be you're going to be uh, made aware if in fact the item you're on is cheaper somewhere else. So tell me that's not a killer function. Here I'll show you a real quick snapshot of how that works on this video. So now we're on the Home Depot site. I'm clicking into a piece of plywood, saying, "Hey, that's what I need." And all of a sudden, boom! Build Club tells you in the background, "Man, you can save a serious chunk of change by going to a different store." And frankly. It's a different Home Depot store. It's not even Lowe's or another supplier. And when you click the link, we automatically change the store for you on the Home Depot site and take you directly to the page. So now you can buy it, have it delivered, pick it up, whatever you do. So we think this is going to be an absolutely amazing tool for the market. There are literally billions of transactions, hundreds of millions that are taking place on these websites every single day. So now anyone is used to it. They don't have to change their behavior and they can be influenced in Build Club and we can show them where they can buy it cheaper. The other great piece of that, that plugin as well is the fact with our drop down that you're able to tell how many pieces of inventory each one of the stores have at a glance and you can scroll through. So again, even if you found the same price somewhere, you can see if you needed 200 items, which is your closest store with 200 items and you can sort it and make it easy. So it's all about making things easier and faster for contractors and DIY folks. So we're also working on a really killer AI tool. This one you may have seen in one of my previews. <clears throat> and the idea is getting what they call a blueprint takeoff directly using AI. So this is a real pain in the butt process. It's all done manually today, usually computer assisted. And someone on the computer has to like measure out each line, come up with the calculations. Now, why do you do this? Of course, you do this because the architect hands a contractor the plans. And generally, architects have no clue what it might cost or what sort of materials it takes to build something pretty that they designed. So the contractor then has to figure out, based on these plans, what do I need? How much drywall? How much lumber? How much material? How much tile? How much flooring square footage? How much wall square footage for paint? How many outlets? How many plugs? All these things, right? So we're working on an AI that can do a lot of that. So this isn't by any means a user interface. This is our, our engineering interface. So I'm just kind of showing you again under the hood. This is tied to a proprietary engine we have back leveraging a lot of the AI tools that are out there 
we're building our own learning and our own tuning of the AI engines to get us what we need to do things. So in this case, we're looking at, like I say, taking a plan. So we're going to simply upload a simple floor plan in this case and say, all right, well, if I'm going to buy drywall to build this place and re-drywall it all, how many sheets do I need? Now, normally there would be many steps in that process. We have to calculate the wall square footage, everything else. And you can see that here are AI, and sorry for the ugly format, but again, this is a development platform. You can see it's calculating the square area of all the walls for each room, interior rooms, mind you, not exterior. It's also subtracting out the gaps for windows, the gaps for doors. So it's gonna come down to the bottom, tell you the actual square area inside net for the facility and show you how many sheets of four by eight drywall you're likely gonna need to do the project. So we think this is gonna come a long way. It's, it's nowhere near doing very complex blueprint plans today, but we'll be continuing to evolve over time as we develop this technology. So we're super excited about this. And again, even as an estimation tool, hey, what roughly does this thing cost to do? We're actually also working on a product that can kick out an entire bill of materials to build something, which means everything, vapor barrier, the number of nails, how many outlet covers, everything that's in a design plan. So stay tuned. That's going to be a longer development cycle. It's quite complex, but it's super cool. So that said, I'll skip to a, a next interesting tool, very similar. So the other problem in this industry is filling out quotes. So any of you who've ever done this, or if I have contractors in the audience, you know this is your biggest pain in the butt, right? So you get a bill of materials. In this case, you can see kind of an ugly list I have here. Uh, there are many different things on the list. Each room may have the same materials listed for each room. Uh, you notice the different units. One might be a sheet, one might be by the inch. You know, it's, it's somewhat confusing in showing you the different areas. So typically what happens when you have this kind of document or a spreadsheet or, you know, frankly, sometimes we get pictures of handwritten documents of what people need. The process of taking it, retyping it, creating a quote for everyone. I'm telling you, Home Depot does this, Lowe's does this, ABC, Builders First Source, every supplier, Beacon Roofing, they all do this. They get the email, they open the PDF of the spreadsheet, they look at it, they type it in. So what typically happens today is a contractor will take this list and, and no kidding, they'll kind of barf it out to 15 vendors. Of those 15 vendors, you might usually get two to three replies. Why? Because not every vendor is going to invest the time to, to you know, do an hour, two hours, three hours to make this quote, unless they really think they have a decent chance of closing the sale and they maybe know the customer. So as a contractor, it's super frustrating because it's very difficult to get competitive quotes because most people don't want to waste the time. As a supplier, it's kind of frustrating too, because you don't really know who to waste time quoting. It might be a brand new, excellent customer who's either really needing the material, or maybe he's just price shopping you because he's going to build in a year. And you just wasted, you know, a day of your time, six hours through two hours, whatever it is, creating that quote. So I'll show you a second example of our iteration AI. And that's actually taking that list I just showed you, which is a pretty ugly list, and, and making that, let me go back here, and making that into a quote. So in this case, I'm going to upload this kind of big, ugly list I showed you. Now, nothing's in a great format, kind of hard to read. You can figure it out. It's got a lot of extra data on there that's kind of confusing. And we're training our AI engine to be able to read that material and actually take it all forward. So in this case, I'm going to select a different component, which is reading our bill of materials. And again, this is a developmental platform, so it's really ugly and the output's not formatted, but hey, what the heck, I'm showing you as things go. And as you can see, it's breaking out all of the items. It's assimilating all the same items that were for different rooms, adding them all together, and then reaching into our database to figure out exactly how much that material costs. So now in a matter of a second, we've generated a custom quote. So being able to not only do this ourselves, 
but provide this tool to all the other 20,000 plus, whatever it is, building materials and hardware stores around the country who want to automate their quoting process and just simply attach their own inventory database is going to be super cool. And again, I'll go back to that data piece I showed you before, our ability to then discern that kind of cryptic, you know, SYP two by four by eight that someone might have on their quote request. And for our systems to understand that that's Southwestern pine and that's a two by four by eight piece of lumber. So that's part of our, again, proprietary engineering to actually be able to understand what's being read off that document, find the appropriate item in our database, and of course, quote, the local price for that zip code. And I'll talk in a moment why that matters on estimating. So one more super cool tool we're really excited about and hope to have out in the near future at some point. So if that wasn't enough, we're now also embracing architects. So for any of you who are familiar, there's a program called Revit. This is run by Autodesk. They're a $5 billion company, about 13,000 employees. They're the largest developer of CAD, computer-assisted drawing software in the world. And they have AutoCAD, which you may have heard, which is a bit more about line-driven designs. Revit is the tool that most developers use for homes, building, multi-tenant buildings, large projects, you name it. They architect it on Revit. And the important thing here is when architects are inside making their plan designs, you hire someone to build an addition ADU in the back of your house. Your architect's going to give you a great plan. You're going to look at it and go, God, that's beautiful. How much, right? And the architect hasn't a clue. I mean, not even a near clue on how much that's going to cost to build because they really don't know what the material components are, let alone what they cost. So what we've done is built a plugin for Revit. We're not finished, we're still working on it, so it's gonna be a little bit. But this is a plugin piece of software that's tied into the Revit platform that will allow architects with the touch of a button to take their model, have our plugin extract all the components of the model, every piece of two by four, lumber, everything they've called out, drywall, insulation, windows, doors, everything that's required. Pull that from our database on exactly what those materials cost in that zip code and kick out an estimated quantity and materials. So it's really cool. So I'll show you a quick brief on this too. This is a screenshot of Revit pulling up an existing design plan. So here's a 3D design for building a facility. All the details are in there, every room, every component, how it needs to be built and made. Then pulling up the Build Club plugin, you're able to decide what components you want to export and price because we can take this model and actually break out their entire bill of materials, which again is very unique to do that with a single touch of a mouse with our plugin. So super cool, they can go through here and select what components they actually want to talk about. And you can see it can get quite detailed and it all depends on how detailed the architect built the map. And we instantly output it to Excel. And I'll notice, you'll, you'll notice here, which is super cool. We actually show the formulas. So you're not just getting some sort of static report that's kicked out in Excel instead of PDF. All the math is there, so it's a full model. So if someone wants to adjust a price, adjust a quantity, do something else, your spreadsheet model is already built. You don't have to build it. All the prices came from our database for the local zip code. So now the architect can come to you and say, hey, you know what? It's gonna be roughly 50 grand in materials. And you know, we estimate labor is usually about three X the cost of materials. So you're looking at $200,000 build. So we think this is gonna really shake up the world. We think architects are gonna love this ability to have this automated process of not only getting their bill of materials, which again is pretty unique, but getting it priced. So we're thrilled about this piece. And again, continuing to develop this as we go and hope to have this in the market probably early Q2. So that said, the only last piece on our data I'll talk about in terms of our productization is data integration. So all these are companies that do estimating for contractors. So if you're a contractor, right, again, the problem is, they're saying, all right, build this ADU for me, make an estimate for a customer. Kind of a painstaking process. You go into one of these pieces of software, you start filling it out. Okay, what are we doing? We're building a 200 square foot ADU in the backyard of someone, you know, wherever in Philadelphia. 
And now you have to start building it out. Here's the walls, here's the paint, here's the concrete, here's the foundation, here's the dimensional lumber, here's the sheathing, here's the plywood, here's, you know, all these other components. The problem is not one of these software have the real-time pricing for materials in any specific zip codes. They are all designed on the average price of plywood nationwide, the average price of R30 insulation. And I'll tell you, being here in Southern California, there's a 40% price difference sometimes between LA and San Diego on dimensional lumber drywall, frankly, and some other very common components. So we also see a fantastic market of taking our API and data feed to all of these estimator providers so that we can provide them on a license, of course, all the material that they need so that they can offer real-time pricing for their estimating. So we're pulling all that API together now. We do have an active API. We haven't sold it yet. So now we're starting to talk to some of these vendors about getting that integration. So I've given you a fire hose dump of a lot of our new products. We're certainly thrilled and excited about it. We've really been heads down working on this stuff for some time. It doesn't happen overnight, but we're looking forward to commercializing many of these real soon. And along the way, of course, you know, we got noticed by Microsoft and Google at the same time, which was pretty funny. And, and not only that, but each one of them has given us a $150,000 grant to work on their AI and development platforms. Mostly we're working AI. The compute stuff is pretty basic. So our compute servers and all that stuff is, is fairly easy to run. Uh, the Vertex AI under Google is doing some amazing stuff. Um, and they have some fantastic search technology. And of course, Microsoft has the partnership with Chap GPT. So their development studio there is, is quite good. And more than money, we get pretty much unlimited technical assistance. And you know, I have to say, Microsoft has been absolutely amazing. We get a call back within two hours of any request, and we can get as senior as an engineer on any topic that we need to help us develop or get through any roadblocks. And that's been just an unbelievable asset. Uh, I think companies normally have to pay a hundred something thousand dollars a year for that kind of support. So, so we're certainly excited about that. And it's really been working well and we're only a few weeks into it and it's been fantastic. So we're really excited. Actually, uh, Google has offered to pay and bring a third party in to help port anything else that we're running and help adapt all of our systems to Google if it's not already running in Google. So we've really hit the ground running. We're getting noticed by the big tech guys, which is Fantastic. We're certainly excited about that. And next question might be, well, how the hell do you make money on this stuff? So, you know, there's there's a couple of different ways we do that. So one, subscription fees. So our goal is to be more of a freemium service. So you're going to see when we launch our plugin that you'll be able to check X amount of products. Haven't figured out that yet. X amount of products for free every month. And then if you start to look at more than whatever it is, 10 or 15 per month that you're looking to source, then you'll pay a subscription fee per month and, and just simply subscribe. And if you look at some of the cost savings we can bring people, even with one, two, three purchases a year, I think it covers that cost well over. Some of those differences in costs are, are, are just phenomenal. If you saw that, like with the plywood and otherwise, it can be a big difference. Other things we're doing is sourcing fees. So again, sourcing back to our sourcing business, that's taking fees for that rather than just margins. Attribution commission. So we can get commission from suppliers. So for example, when someone clicks on our plugin and it launches someone to Menard's website or Home Depot or Lowe's, they have affiliate programs where they actually pay us a commission for the link if someone bought what they linked to. So that's how a lot of other sort of commission things work. So that's kind of cool. Uh, advertising on our site, of course. So what, just like you would on Google Flights or others, when you're on our discovery website, then um, you imagine Home Depot or, or Lowe's or Menards or someone else paying to have their lumber listed first, right? And you'd have kind of sponsored on top, like you might see on Google, you know, ads maybe on the side. So we'll be figuring that out. And then of course, licensing fees, when you look at the API going into those estimating platforms, that's just a typical kind of SaaS licensing fee. So we see a lot of ways of making money, great recurring revenue, very low marginal cost of goods sold on these, which is great. So really shifting that business to a pure software kind of SaaS company along with that sourcing service. So we got a lot going on. 2024, what are we looking forward to? Well, we're not looking forward to the election, but other than that, 
We're looking forward to, you know, converting sourcing business to a fee-based model. We think that's going to be awesome. We're launching our subscription services this year. We're going to be leveraging our 76,000 registered customers into all these new products and subscriptions. So we're hoping to get a nice take rate on that. Certainly launching discovery, like I'd mentioned, the advertising, commercializing our quoting tool, and doing a lot of other amazing things. So I appreciate everyone taking the time to learn a little bit more about the Build Club. I hope I was enough to get you under the hood to keep you interested and show you really what we're doing, rather than in just kind of a blustery sales conversation. And I'm happy to take any questions we've got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that wonderful presentation. And as Stephen mentioned, if you had any questions, please leave them in the uh, chat box below. We're going to go through some of those right now. Let's see. Do we have any here? here? It, someone's asking is, why do you not show 84 Lumber Co? Oh, you know, I could show all sorts of folks. They're a great supplier too. There are so many out there, ABC, Beacon, there's many, many suppliers. So we really source from all those guys. And, you know, you know, there are a lot of great companies out there and I just probably didn't have space for them all. Awesome. And then I already answered this question for you, Enrique, but yeah, we will be posting the webinar on the Start Engine page. We'll also be sending an email out with the, with the replay. So be on the lookout. 100%. And we got to be vague with this, Stephen, but what is the minimum investment amount? I, you know, we're just, I think we're around 490 or so. I encourage you to check the start engine page, but yeah, it's, it's, it, we revised recently and brought that up a bit. So I think originally it was in the 250 ish range and we brought that up a couple of months ago. How does all of this impact the build club? When, you know, it's, it's a new year. How's all, how's all this technological advancements going to help you guys out? You know, it really shifts us to a different business model, more on, on the software side, more of recurring revenue, more of subscription, frankly, much, much greater margins. So a lot of our kind of historical business we had done was, was the on-demand selling, still a great business, great demand there. I think the challenge with that when it comes to scale is it demands a ton of capital to be able to do that everywhere well in the country. And look, as a startup, at the end of the day, my primary concern, other than providing the best products I can to customers in the market, is getting the best return I can from, frankly, myself and my investors. And there's a decision with every startup you you kind of have to make along the way. And that is, you know, every time, it, so, so for example, if we decided we wanted to really expand that sourcing business and raise whatever, $50 million from venture capital and expand, the challenge with that is you've now just upped your company's cap table to where now instead of maybe having to sell the company for 100 or 200 million dollars to make your investors a lot of money now you got to sell for a billion and that does a few things a it adds a lot more risk uh, because it's just more time for issue two i think it's a lot fewer companies can afford you at a billion or 5 billion than they can at you know 2 or 300 million and and again it just it 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 creates a different mechanism on getting returns. So I always have to look on what our likelihood return is. How do we get the, the best yield for our investors? I think the other thing you find with kind of tech SaaS companies and really where we're leaning hard into our tech is they tend to get bought quicker at a higher multiple than I think a lot of other types of companies do. So, you know, our focus is really honed in on, on you know, what made us unique in our ability to deliver and be an on-demand delivery company was all this technology. And to be frank, you know, after, you know, taking a, a little bit of time to, to soul search our business, we're like, gosh, you know, we're really just not leveraging that amazing stuff we created because ultimately, you know, delivering and things, that's great, but we think we can bring a lot more to the market and scale a lot faster with software. So I think fundamentally, that's where we really decided to, to lean a lot further into our own technology and, and maybe a little less on, on focusing on just geographic expansion or you know selling more product. Hope that answered the question. <laughs> What's the ETA for a full rollout? Well, each product has its different life cycle. So if I were to guess, our so our website is already out, the price discovery website. So I encourage you to kind of clunk it around. You'll find it's not perfect, but we're getting there. We're doing a lot of work on the back end still with the data. I think we'll probably see the plugin over the next maybe six weeks go commercial and we'll have that out. So we're near commercial on that. It's working really well. 
the Revit stuff probably around that same timeline, maybe six weeks, two months. And some of the AI machine vision stuff, we'll probably see the quoting tool come out before the blueprint tool because the blueprint stuff is, is you know, it's, it's a much a much more detailed task having to, to read many different components. And we're also, frankly, trying to come up with certain, I guess you'd say, requirements because there's a million different ways you can print a blueprint. So we're trying to say, all right, well, what can we ask people to output? Can we give you a specific template or format and say, hey, print your Revit model in this format or you know, print your AutoCAD or whatever with these components, then we can read it easier. So we're still working on that. And frankly, we're a small team. So we have to really focus on where we think we have the biggest market. So, so that's a rough estimate of timeline. We tend to like to roll things out while they're still kind of not finished. But I, I think that's really just the agile method is to get it out there, get people's comments. Because one thing you you really figure out in a startup when you load when you load new products, um, you know, was it Mike Tyson who said, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. You you really, you think you know what the market wants or how they're going to use it. But once people really use it and they send you comments, you're like, oh, gosh, I, I didn't think about that. Or, or you know, we missed something. So, so we'd like to get it out sooner than later. So hopefully it won't be too long for any of these things. And then can you talk a little bit more about the 5 million DRD contract? Are there any other updates? You know, that's been really rolling along. They've been a little slow in the Air Force. You know, we had announced that we had sold on the 5 million contract. We shipped our first 60,000. We've quoted out about another 2 million in product under that contract. So we're hoping we'll get chunks of those coming through soon. We've also sold uh, Snavering, I think it was last week or the week before, another 8,000 of other materials. So we're selling other stuff to the Department of Defense and not just stuff under that contract. So it's continuing to ramp and, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about hopefully delivering that soon. You know, the thing about the government is, you know, you think they got a ton of money and I guess they do, but they have strange cycles on when things can be purchased and when they have them. So we've done a lot of the budgeting work where they were building their budgets for their next fiscal year, where they've requested for like a gazillion quotes from us. So we've been sending in all these quotes. So we're hoping we can close, you know, at least a third or maybe half of that. But, you know, we never know until we get it. But uh, we're feeling pretty good. We got pretty good relationships out there. Uh, we've been expanding to other bases with the Air Force and doing some work there. We've sold to some other groups and military as well. I think we had announced that we already so we're selling stuff here locally to to Department of Airports. We did about fifty grand worth of concrete for the LAX project. We hope to get more there. We're bidding on some deals for the Department of Water and Power. So we we think there's there's great opportunity there too. And again, it's it's like sourcing as a service, right? We're really just doing the same thing for the government. Because we're we're not looking to do too many things, different things to different people. We're really trying to stay focused, but it's kind of the same thing. So hopefully a lot more soon. We're excited about it. And so far, at least the contracts we've had, they've been paying on time rather quickly. So it's been a good thing. We we're afraid we might get strung out, but it looks like it's working out well. Awesome. Meet there. Any future expansion planned across the nation? You know, with our with our new business model, we really don't have to have footprint anywhere, to be honest. It's really about having, you know, our team is spread out around the world. We've got people in Germany, Ukraine, and the United States, of course. And gosh, we've got an AI working with us in Egypt. I mean, it's really all over. So we're really looking for the best talent we possibly can. We have a large adjunct kind of faculty, if you want to call it that, of talent. So we've got about 25, 30 engineers that are highly experienced specialists that we don't need full time. But when we do need that expert in whatever vertex AI and vectoring, we've got a guy, all right? And, you know, we need him or her for whatever it is, 40 hours. And we'll get them involved in the project, wrap them in, get them in our Slack channel, and off we go. And then we disengage for a month or two, and we engage someone else. And that might be like the expert we have right now in Egypt, who's expert on the Microsoft technology systems, and we're working on some of the back end there. So... We found a, a very, and I've been doing this for some time in my career, frankly, that we've just found a really efficient method of having the right people at the right time to kick it out. Because at the end of the day, you know, the judgment of a company is going to be the value we bring to the market and frankly, what our what our exit is and not how many people we employed. So we try to really keep it as lean as possible and kick out the product as efficiently as we can. And then what are the marketing strategies do you achieve optimum? No. What are the marketing strategies to achieve optimum market exposure? Do you plan to hire a sales team on a commission basis? You know, that gets really expensive. And I think you'll find a lot of the places, you know, I, I have kind of a funny rule that 
if I'm looking at a SaaS product or something online that I'm interested in for the business or otherwise, and they say, call for a quote and a salesperson will get a hold of you, I already know it's too expensive, right? <laughs> if they can, if they have to pay a salesperson to interact and have a conversation with me, then I know it's too much. So I like to see the prices online. So, so I, I don't know if direct sales, at least at this moment, is probably the right thing for us. That said, this is one of the great mysteries of building a company is what's the most efficient marketing? So one of the ways we drive a ton of traffic to our website, frankly, is through Google Shopping and having aggressive prices on Google Shopping. So if we can identify the lowest price we can source a material from and post that on our site with Google Shopping, we get tons of traffic. So that's one kind of method to drive people in to either A, buy from us and have us source it. And frankly, there's a there's a huge number, and I'd mentioned on a previous webinar of the, you know, I think we'd had what, oh, 1.7 million, whatever it is, you know, visitors to our website and how few actually bought from us, which is normal, right? You don't close everyone who hits your website. So our goal was, well, all those people who decided not to buy from us, maybe we were too expensive. Maybe they didn't want that same day delivery. They're just looking for the product. Now with our kind of new web discovery site, they can find a tool there that they can self-source. So all of those people who went to our website, we can essentially monetize that. Because in the past, you only monetize maybe that 1% or 2% that buy from you. In this case, we'll monetize those people still. We'll sell them something with our full service sourcing. But there may be a big chunk of all those other people who hit our site are like, eh, you know what, I don't want that whatever $100 delivery truck fee for today. But gosh, I'll use your discovery site and find the lowest place to go buy it myself because I'm just going to go pick it up in my truck. And, and now we think that these products will allow us to, to get that incremental gain out of that same marketing spend. So it, it always comes to, you know, Google search advertising tends to work. Some Facebook stuff tends to work. And we're looking when we roll out the browser extension, frankly, to get as much word of mouth as we can. We'd love to get exposure with influencers, maybe the DIY shows, right, where people are fixing up the homes and making those TV shows. We can show people using our tool to save money and buy their materials cheaper. So we're, we're constantly really looking to build that repertoire. So once we launch, we can send that out. But that's always the one of the greatest questions, frankly, and frankly, any company, no matter what size I've, I've run, that getting that marketing spend right so that you can bring the eyeballs in. So we'll be working hard on that this year and hopefully we'll we'll get it right. And then congrats on your Google Cloud startup program. How have you applied this to, to your growth? Well, in a, in a couple of ways. One, we get access to the engineering resource that we never would have had. In engineering, you don't know what you don't know. So we think we have the best architecture on our data, for example. We, you know, when you're when you're processing almost a billion records a month, which is what we're doing now, it, it's no trite task. A, a, if you look at an if-then statement in a, in a database, frankly, in a select query, inserting records, when you're doing that for hundreds of millions of records, um, a single logic in your code can add one, two, three hours of processing because it just takes a lot of horsepower. So we're always looking to talk to those engineers and say, hey, look, you guys are Google, right? you know how to do this better. How, how can I run this better? I mean, some things we've done to improve speed, for example, is by keeping all of our compute resources in a single zone. So Google Cloud operates in regions and zones. So being in a region, say Western US, and having all of the same resource in zone four, right? Meaning that they're essentially like in the same data center. And we've discovered not only does that speed up our processing quite a bit because the computer systems talking to each other are closer, but it also reduces cost because none of that data has to transfer the internet. So there are lessons on cost savings, there's lessons on efficiency, and frankly, there's just lessons on technology and code. This stuff is changing so quickly. I mean, I can't, weeks go by and new tools pop up. Or for any of you who are in AI and you look at Hugging Face and you see some of these new models that are being tested and out there, this stuff is popping up every day. So some things that were best of class three months ago are kind of outdated. So we're continually trying to build the right agile modules in our software so that when something better comes up, we can plug it in and just keep running and that we don't have to rewrite everything. So it takes a bit of thought pulling it together, but we don't always have all the best answers. So we're, we're always happy to talk to these engineers and that's the biggest impact. And look, I won't joke, the 150K from each one of these guys is a great thing too. I mean, it, 
it allows us to do some experimentation without burning cash. So if we want to try and run something on a Microsoft server and do some AI analytics, and it's going to cost five grand. I might normally really think hard about that and find alternate ways of testing that technology if I didn't have a credit. So I think that it, it gives us a lot of room to experiment without burning cash flow. Awesome. The last question I see here is your funds raise will provide you how many months of runway? But you know, that's always a tricky question because it all depends what you burn. Our goal, just so you know, this year in 24 is to be cash flow neutral to positive. So we want to be able to get it through the end of this next raise. We're going to do a little bit longer raise, we we believe, through the end of, or not through the end, but through through 24 to some extent, again, undecided. Uh, but our goal is really by the by the end of 24 latest to be cash flow positive. Do we get there? Does the world change? Do we get a bigger slug of investment or do we get bought or does something happen along the way? Man, who knows? But But that's our target today. And that's where we're heading because, again, keeping the cap table tight allows us to get a much better multiple for our investors. We expect this type of tech company to tend to be sold, you know, you know, who knows? And again, you, it's very difficult to say these kinds of things on these regulated discussions, but but they tend to go a little faster than than longer. So that's our our goal, whether it happens, who knows? But but our goal really is to to keep the cap lab, table as tight as we can because we think there's a lot of companies who if they were to acquire us and plug us in, can get a lot more mileage. I mean, if you think of a company like a Home Depot or a Lowe's and the, the tens of millions of dollars they're spending on doing quotes and things alone for customers off the pro desk and other things that they do, you know, our software tools can save them a gazillion dollars and we'd be a rounding error. So, you know, not saying there's anything there, but but I think there's just a lot of angles like that with many other companies, I think around the around the world, frankly. And, and the one other piece I'll mention about, you know, kind of our software business model, and I was just on with my one of my investors overseas the other day, that this business model now can be expanded globally. So everything we're doing digitally, I described to you today, will work in the UK, will work in France, will work in Malaysia, will work in just about any other country. So that makes us far more scalable for license, for partnering for other things. We're too small now to go dipping into those waters. We just don't need to. The US is big enough but we could easily do deals with others who can. So so we're pretty excited about 24. Then a question came in here. When do you see coming into Montana and how as an investor can we be part of this transition? Well, Montana, you know, we can serve all 50 states and deliver same day. I mean, we we do that outsourced sourcing in all states now, we, including Puerto Rico and other places. Frankly, we've done everywhere, all the territories and states, Guam, you name it, we've, we've done it all over. We don't offer two-hour service there. It's a bit sparse, as you know, there aren't a ton of suppliers. There's, there's not a huge density, but we can service that market. And, and you know, we, of course, outsource delivery. So from the actual delivery part, we do so. We do that area there. Obviously, our digital products will have probably. I'm not sure if we're covering Montana yet. I'll have to check. But we'll probably, if we're not covering it now with the data that we secure, we probably will be within the next 30 days. We plan on having, you know, our goal is over the next three to four months to have probably 2,000 plus stores that we scan nationwide, and that's just a tremendous amount of data, and that would be in all 50 states. So. Can't give you exactly for that. Send me an email separately and I can look that up for you if you like and let you know when we might be in that market if you haven't seen our price competitiveness on our discovery website yet. And then question here, I know that there are variables, but best guess of what type of return as investors that we're looking for, best guess. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Look, I and again, you know, all of this is going to be cut by compliance and never get to see on the video again, I'm sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I always look for a 10x for myself and my investors. Will I get there? I have no idea. That's my target. In my history, I've only gotten below it once for my investors in about a 9.7 in 18 months. So it still wasn't bad. So that, that's usually one of my bellwethers. And of course, you know, you don't want to take in 20 years to get there. So our goal is to do it fast, get a respectable return. And, you know, to be honest, you know, again, this is a financial transaction for us. We love what we do. We want to change the world. But at the end of the day, you know, we're here to create value and frankly, make money for ourselves and investors. So, you know, it, it, it just is what it is. That's what business is about. So, you know, my process has been as with my board of advisors and others that, you know, no good offer goes unheeded. So it's, I've known many people who've kind of foregone good offers because they wanted, you know, to be a billionaire and wound up with almost nothing. So I've been through this rodeo enough to know when you, when you get good offers on the table, you take a hard look at them. 
So hard to say where it lands, but look, I've spent a ton of my time and frankly, a ton of my money as well. And you know, I, I think we are in a wonderful space. The construction and the te- there's been almost no tech in construction over the last two, three decades. And all of it's going to happen, I believe, in the next five to 10 years. So I think our timing is excellent. And frankly, timing, you know, in many cases matters more than, than frankly, even strategy or, or design or product in some cases. So I think we've got our timing right. I believe we've got our product right. So we're super excited. And look, time will tell. All sorts of strange things can happen in the world, but we're, like I say, we're very optimistic about 24 and and really looking forward to a lot of these products hitting the market. Well, Stephen, I'm not seeing any more questions. Coming. Fabulous. I'll give everybody up if there's any couple of minutes left in their day. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate everybody spending the time with us today. And thank you, Phil, for another uh, webinar and, and certainly enjoyed it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, everyone who attended. And if you had to hop off early at any time, don't worry. The webinar was recorded. So we'll be posting the, uh, the recap in the next coming days. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Hope everyone has a good day. Bye.